Let's refill your mind with spooky true crime stories of the deranged, unhinged, and absolute pure evil murders that will blow your mind. Some places you will visit to show you around and educate you on the history. Other times we will bring you to the paranormal because the dead never lie silent for too long. It'll be the last time anybody sees us alive. I don't know where she has us, but we're gonna get something killed. Hello? Gina, there is a beehive over there. Do you see that in the hole? Buckle up, Buttercup. Welcome to 50 States of Madness. This episode contains content that may be alarming to some listeners. The topic presented today is of a graphic nature and we'll be discussing violence against children. We do our best to talk about these topics with respect and sincerity, and we hope you will join us whenever you feel ready and able. Welcome to 50 States of Madness. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> I was not in my pre-production pose. I like oh normally God. have to start like, hey, everybody. Yeah, so, she gets ready every time I say, are you ready? She'll just say. I'm like. She uh, doesn't say anything. She just smiles. Is it Jam Brady? Or who is yeah. it that freezes in front of the camera? That's Yeah, me. Jam Brady. Yeah. yeah. It's really hard. They see hard. the little red light blinking, then it's like. It's really hard. You don't know what it's like to talk to a camera with nobody. Well, I have Gina in front of me, so it makes it a little bit easier. I feel bad for the people that do it by themselves. No, but seriously, like it, it's still hard, you know? Yeah. No, it's, it is. It's, it's really hard. People don't get it, yeah. how hard it is to. We may look really natural in doing it and it just takes a lot of work, but it does. Uh, it's really, really hard. <laughs> this job. Yeah, it is. So anybody Ask, that wants to say anything yeah. nasty, go ahead, put it go in right on ahead. <laughs> but just for know, watching. I want to see you get up here and yeah. do this. I'll be like, thanks for watching. Yeah. Uh, ask me how my weekend was. Ask me, ask me, ask me. I want to share some things with you. Well, I was with you all weekend. So well, no, one day, one, you, one little point of my de- time, you weren't with me. Oh, how was your weekend? Well, it was really, really fun. And yeah, you were with me. <laughs> But I, well, I will the story I want to share. Okay. So I'm working at Starbucks on Sunday. Mm-hmm. I am telling you on Sunday, I had the day at my Starbucks. I had, well, it was really a Gina fan club day coming through my Starbucks or Gina friend day. I don't even know what to call it. But first I see, well, my neighbors, of course, always greet me. So I love that all my neighbors come by and they're like, hey, neighbor. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but I had. Uh, and you're going to have to help me with names. Okay. He used to, he came to your birthday party. He came with his wife and he used to work with us. Super tall guy. Um, he was an aide with C- us. Craig? Craig. He came by the drive-thru with his wife and kids. Oh. So I got to see them. I know. Craig and Chrissy. Uh, hi, Craig and Chrissy. Oh, okay. I got to see them. And then. Um, that really, was many, many moons ago. Yes. Okay. And then really pretty girl I'm gonna try to it's gonna be like charades okay because I'm gonna try she has a husband but anyway they come through and they're order they ordered and everything and they came up and I'm helping them do 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 and she goes oh, you are friends with Gina and I was like yes I am she's you have that podcast don't you I worked with Gina and I'm like oh you did thank you and at the school at school well, I'm gonna assume at school you know what good question <laughs> her name and I'm Oh my gosh, please forgive me if I get it wrong because she says she watches us. Elise? 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 Was it oh. Elise? Like she said like 10 years ago. Like she, long black hair. Okay, maybe I'm not saying her name right. Wait, she worked there 10 years ago? It, or maybe she said it's been like 10 years since she saw me. I was really super busy. This I'm telling you, Starbucks is popping on Sundays. <laughs> um, It might have been Elise, but she... Elise. Yes, yes. Elise. Eli- yeah. Elise. The, Elise. I, did I say Elise that right? Chavez. Yes. Really pretty. Yeah. Long she, black hair. Yeah. Did she Super have... Cute. Have her husband tattoos. Oh, oh, yeah. Josh. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, really nice That's couple. Elise and Josh. Yeah. And, yeah. They're, and they have three little girls. Yes. And they came by with the kids. I didn't see them because the window oh. was tinted. But yeah, I had like a, a day on Sunday. Oh. Everybody coming through that I knew. So, Oh, yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, I did pretty good. Yeah. No. Look at that. I'm telling you. And then we went line dancing this weekend. Twice. Twice. Sat s- Friday night. We went Friday night. So, yes, we went with Dickless and we went with my friend from work, Jasmine. And yes. then I have a friend that I worked with during the summer. She was a teacher that worked during the summer, Alex. And she brought her line dancing crew because she's like a line dancing professional. Can we put that video up in here 
of them flipping you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gina gets flipped. <clears throat> yeah. So, and she specifically came because she's like, oh, well, you know, my people can like teach you how to do like a backflip and whatever. And I was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> sure. And yeah, I, I did it. I know. <laughs> a cowgirl backflip. Yeah, I did it. A um, line dancing backflip. Yeah. So for anybody wondering if I am like a country girl now, no. 100%. Oh, no. Yeah. No, she's been wearing her boots. She won't take them off. That's Between a lie. Between me and you, she was singing country music all the way home she is by Saturday night. <laughs> she is Don't such a liar. Her. <laughs> Ask her what I wore on Saturday when we went back the second time. Vans. Vans and a pair of jeans. <laughs> jeans. Yeah. But we went back on Saturday nights because Gina, being as loopy as she was on Friday night, she was not <laughs> drinking at all. She got drunk off water and Sprite, but she forgot her ID and card I for our tab. My debit card there at the bar, so I had to go but back. It gave us a reason to but go it was back fun. the next day. Yeah, it and was to fun. Take we another took lesson. more line dancing, yeah. and we did pretty good. We did. And this time, I wish we would have had Gus... Uh, record us because oh, we right. did the two step we did. and we did another couple's dance and I think that we did like Amazing. I think we did pretty good well Gus said that we were the cutest couple out there of course so he better say that I know. <laughs> he better say that <laughs> so it was, it was a lot of fun so we need to go back yeah so um yeah so I we had so fun and yeah, I really, I really enjoyed it. I'm not a fan of country music. I never have been. I still am not a fan of country music, but well, I love to dance. And so it was just, and a lot of the music that they play is not all country music. That's what I was going to say. It's like, yeah, they even played, um, Megan, this Ma Megan, the Sal stallion. How do you say her name? Megan? Oh, Megan, the stallion. Yeah. I p just posted that um, video to my Instagram story Did you really? today. I just <laughs> graced everybody with that. Everybody's like, oh my God, she, uh, what is she doing? I'm, I'm like, amazing. I don't know, but I love it. <laughs> it's good. Um, you know what? You just got to dance with confidence. You know what? People are going to question themselves. They're going to think like, does she know the moves and it's everybody else who's off exactly. or what's going on? Cause she's so confident. That's exactly I correct. <laughs> That is exactly what's happening, you guys. It's exactly what's happening. Everybody was looking at her like, oh, my God, we got it wrong. wrong. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it was, it was good. Yeah, so we had a very uh, we had a very fun weekend, and we have another fun weekend coming up, too, because we're going to yeah. go to the, see the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I'm excited. It's my first time. Yes, it's amazing. I've seen the movie, but uh, it's my first time going to, like, one of these live, live events. Thing. Yeah, so, so it's going to be a lot of fun. So that's where we're going to spend our Easter morning at. I know. At I the Rocky Horror <laughs> Picture Show. That's where we're going to be at. And then yeah. straight from there, we're going to go to Sunrise. Sunrise service. <laughs> In, costume. In costume. <laughs> In our outfits. Yeah. Uh, today we're going to talk about J.C. Lee Dugard. So J.C. Lee Dugard was kidnapped by a couple, Philip and Nancy Garrido, back in 1991. And she was held there captive for 18 years and then later found and reunited with her family that's crazy yeah she has written two books and her first book that she wrote when she got out I read years and years and years ago when she got out and the first one kind of details everything that she went through and she also kept a journal it's just always been something that's been in the back of my mind the courage that she had as a child I mean, she's a woman now in her early 40s, but the courage that this girl had. Uh, and <clears throat> I know you asked, she always asked me, please don't ask me any questions. Yeah, she fires questions <laughs> off like, bam, 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 like I like I <laughs> lived it. I did, like the inside. Go yeah. ahead. I'll try to answer your questions. Okay. Well, no, this one's just, how old was she when she wrote the first book? That I don't know. I think she, I think it was probably like uh, maybe 10 years ago. Okay, so she was like in her 30s. Well, she was 29 years old when she got out. She was 11 years old in fifth grade oh, when wow. she was kidnapped, and she was 29 when, when, she, got when out? she got out. So she was in her 30s. Okay. Yeah, yeah. so she was, she's grown, and she's now, I think, 42 or 43 years old. So okay. this actually happened in California. She is taken to a city called Antioch, California. So on Monday, June 10th, 1991, in South Lake Tahoe, it was JC's last day of school. She left for school every morning at 8.05 to catch her school bus that would pick her up at 8.12. Her stepfather was in the garage and watched J.C. walk down the driveway out towards the street. So 
her biological father is not in the picture, was never in the picture, and she was not very close to her stepfather. That morning, her mom was running late for work, and her mom said that the one thing that she remembers is that she didn't have time to kiss her and her other daughter goodbye. And she said, oh, I'll just kiss them when I get home. And that was like her thing that she did every morning. But she had been late for the last couple of days to work. And so she remembers saying, I'll give you a kiss when I get home. And she never got the chance. So JC walks out towards the street. Her stepfather sees a car drive by JC, comes up to the end of the street, makes a U-turn, goes back towards her, opens the door and takes her. The right stepfather her watches house. everything. So she had started to walk up this hill. She says, they always taught me to walk against traffic. So she was walking on the right side of the road to be more safe. Her stepfather watched everything happen. Did he jump in the car? And He grabbed a bike because he was panicking. Oh, grabbed, grabbed a bicycle. You wouldn't even know what to do. <clears throat> like. No. So grabbed a bicycle, tried to chase them and then realized that he couldn't came back home, called 911. He told the 911 operator that his daughter was just kidnapped, that she got into a gray Ford and there was a man and a woman in the car. When they opened the door, Nancy, Philip's wife, had a stun gun and hit her with the stun gun. She said that she remembers her body kind of feeling tingly all over, but she didn't know what, what happened, happened or why she was feeling that way. And then threw her in the car, pinned her down, and then drove off. And she said for the ride back to their house, she was just kind of in and out of consciousness, not really remembering a whole lot. So the police started searching. They went back to the bus stop. They checked the school bus that she was supposed to be on, the other buses. They checked the whole area. What, they didn't believe the stepdad at first that she was kidnapped? Because he's the only eyewitness to this. He's, of course, going to be a suspect. Okay. There was no sign of her anywhere. They drove her over 170 miles from South Lake Tahoe to this city called Antioch, California. At the time, they were living in Philip's mother's home. They already had a place for JC set up inside a makeshift recording studio at the back of their house. So in their backyard, they had Philip Garrido played the guitar. And so he had like a makeshift recording studio with soundproof walls. And he had everything set up where he was going to hold her captive. And it was basically like a compound for the first month or two. I believe she never came out of that room that they kept her in. And then eventually as time went on, she was let out little by little. They made her like a tent where she could stay in like a tent outside but for the majority of the time she was outside in this little compound that they made for her the authorities were working with her stepfather to create a drawing of the couple he was able to remember what the woman looked like but didn't get a good look at the male that was driving the only thing the police had to go on was what the stepfather witnessed because he's literally the only one that saw what happened because he was the last person to see her he did become a suspect the detectives would continually question him both jc's mother and stepfather both cooperated with the authorities the police were going door to door showing jc's picture and asking if anyone had seen her they also had a canine team searching all of the forested areas there were thousands of tips that were coming in and the police were looking into all of the theories during JC's time that she lived with the Garritos, Philip was repeatedly raping her. When she was 14 years old, she gave birth to her first daughter. She said that she remembers them telling her they thought she was pregnant. She received no medical care and she gave birth outside. He delivered the baby. He like watched videos on how to do births at home. And she said, well, at 14, I only had a fifth grade education. So I didn't know very much, but it made me happy to know that I had somebody because she says she was very, very lonely. It's amazing what a woman's body can do, though, in healing itself. Yeah. Because imagine, like I know for thousands of years, women have given birth without the assistance, but right. we, we just don't do that anymore. Yeah. And like just to know that mm -hmm. she gave birth and was able to heal without Outside. any medical attention at all. Yeah. Outside. That's crazy. And, and to be okay afterwards. Yeah. And she said that when she was in labor, she said that she remembers laying there. And by this point, you got to remember, she this is already three years into her capture. She was laying there and he had, by this point, allowed her to watch in TV because in the beginning she wasn't allowed to have anything. She just journaled the whole time and wasn't really allowed to do anything or go anywhere. 
And she said that she remembers watching the show Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman and that her stomach started to hurt her and she was by herself and they weren't home. And so she was out there in labor for hours on her own, not realizing that she was in labor. When they finally came home, they came back to check on her and she told them, my stomach's really hurting me. Then they prepared for her to deliver the baby. And then when the baby was delivered, the umbilical cord was wrapped around the baby's neck. And so he had to take it off. But she just said that that became her best friend because she had nobody to talk to it was years before she even met the wife he was her only interaction that she had so the wife helped kidnap her but she never had after Mm -hmm. that any interaction no she named her first daughter angel only 14 years old having a baby yeah i mean i had my son very young and Mm -hmm. i can't even imagine being that young i know you know that's like really and especially when your education stops at 11 although in many ways she grew up way too fast he would make her watch things on tv adult to teach her that's basically how she learned everything because she came from this very different family different upbringing than this and she wasn't exposed to that three years later when she was 17 years old she gave birth to her second daughter starlet she does not want them out in the public eye at all. She's kept a lot of stuff hidden. But what she has said is they are doing well. By 1995, only four years later, the investigation just went cold because they they really had nothing to go on. And they would have like a forensic artist do like an age progression drawing of what she would look like years later. And they did this up until adulthood with her. How accurate were those drawings? Uh, They were pretty accurate. They always gave her blonde hair, but at some point her hair turned brown so she has dark hair now but facially she was it was pretty spot on yeah it was it was pretty good and so this whole time she relied on him for everything for food she didn't have access to a bathroom she used a bucket for a bathroom and her kids same she breastfed so it was her responsibility to basically raise these these babies on her own and that's what she did But outside, we can put up some pictures of what the backyard looked like. But it was just like this huge makeshift tent. And then it's like a homeless encampment. It does. And that's where her kids spent their first 15 years of life. Like that's all they knew. At some point, she actually took a little tent and made a makeshift school. And she said with the fifth grade education, that's all I could teach them. But I taught them how to read and write as much as I could, their ABCs and all of that. And so she was basically teaching them in the backyard. So at some point, he made her change her name. So he let her choose her name, but she was not allowed to go by JC. So she chose Alyssa because she was a fan of the show Who's the Boss? And she liked Alyssa Milano. She had to refer to herself as... Alyssa and in a lot of her journals you see where she would sign her name and they're ripped off because if he ever got a hold of her journal that she was still using JC yeah they had a printing business that's I guess how they made their money so she basically started working for him and she would do business cards stationery stuff like that after time he started to give her a little more leeway and she was let into the house and she spoke with customers on the phone about their orders there was a lady that they interviewed who they had done business cards for her and they came out like something was spelled incorrectly and he said oh, okay you'll have to talk to Alyssa because she's the one that did it this lady spoke with her never knowing that she was JC Dugard wow So in June of 2006, a neighbor called police because he saw young girls, which were the daughters, in the backyard and assumed that they were living back there or something was happening. It was just basically never looked into. I want to kind of touch a little bit on Philip Garrido. So in 1972, he was 21 years old and he raped a girl and the girl was too afraid to testify and so the case was dropped never nothing ever happened with it in the meantime he's just out roaming the streets four years later in 1976 november 22nd he's arrested for aggravated assault and rape and sentenced to 50 years in prison for kidnapping and given a life sentence for rape in the state of nevada so he 
raped another woman. He took her into a storage facility and it just so happened that there was an officer there and she ran out. He was sent to Kansas to serve out his sentence. After serving 11 years, he convinced the parole board to release him. But he's sentenced to life. I don't understand how that's even possible. Yeah. Like at least a minimum, if you're in life, a minimum 30 years. He convinced them in a very short period of time. His parole meeting was a matter of like, I want to say something like 18 minutes or something. Like it was a very short period of time. So he met his wife, Nancy, there at prison, at the prison, because she was there visiting her uncle who was serving time. We talked about this before where we never can understand how a woman can go into a prison, especially sex offenders yep. and not even just regular sex offenders. Like this man was caught, like he admitted he liked to while looking at seven year old girls. Like, yes, he has sick in the mind, it's sick disgusting. in the head. Yeah. And he was released. They end up getting married and she ends up being his sidekick in all of this. So it's a video of him in a park standing up against a tree and he's playing the guitar. His wife is recording him. And in the video, you hear him say like, oh, can you see me? Can you see me? But the video is not on him. She's actually recording the children behind him that are playing at the park. And he would use these videos of kids. Obviously, when J.C. Dugard was kidnapped. She's the one that used the stun gun on her. So she was, she had a huge part to do in all of this too. I just don't see how they let this man out. When he's released after 11 years, he's released on parole. And But who takes responsibility for that? Like if my child got kidnapped after you released this monster into the world, who's responsible for that? The I'll, state of Kansas? I'll, I'll get there. Okay. <laughs> So he's released and he is released on parole. The parole officers had come to do checks on him, drug tests, all different kinds of things. And I think that they just come sometimes unannounced just to check and see where you're living. And if he was in there for those type of crimes, then I'm sure he's not allowed to be around children. And they're not checking the entire property? No. There is body cam footage of the parole officer walking through the house and JC is literally 30 feet from him in the backyard. And he with, never went out. Never. Did any of them interact with JC at all? Yes, one. One time they came face to face because she was in the home. Um, she was, like I said previously, on occasion let into the home to do certain things. Not for very long. But I think that was maybe like an unannounced visit or something like that. And yeah, they came face to face with her. They the parole officer asked him who she was and he said that it was his brother's daughter and they didn't they check didn't, they didn't yeah nothing. like look it up like they okay does the they, brother have they, a daughter they, especially since he's not supposed to be around children children yeah. and even if she wasn't a child let's say she was by this point an adult 18 well, 19 20 what about the neighbors that called and reported to children, children in the yeah. backyard why aren't they checking on that do we um, even know if Philip even had a brother? Like, who knows? Like, yeah, do they have that information? Yeah, it's nothing was ever looked into. This this whole case was, uh, the ball was dropped multiple times. By multiple, By multiple people. people. <laughs> yeah. So throughout the years, Philip's behavior became increasingly bizarre. He created a blog called Voices Revealed and a church called God's Desire. He had this contraption where he said that he would talk to, he called it his angel box, and he said that he would hear voices of angels. He would do this with JC there. She said that he would like talk to the walls, like he would hear voices coming out of the walls. He had her listening to different things through the air conditioner. He even actually had some of his clients that were from his printing business sign affidavits that they also heard these voices along with him. Yeah. And then later they were very sorry that they did, but he convinced just like in, you know, previous stories that we've done where there's a lot of brainwashing going on, you know, and yeah, I but think if I'm going for business cards with this print guy, but he was trying to sell himself as like, you know, this preacher, this, guru. this, yes. And that's how he ended up getting caught in August of 2009 
He went to the University of Berkeley to inquire about holding a religious event on campus. The woman that he spoke with on the campus said that he had two young girls with him and that he was acting odd. So he had two daughters with him. So she asked him to come back the next day when she had more time to talk to him. In the meantime, she shared her concern with an officer about his odd behavior. So there was a police officer on campus at Berkeley and she was just kind of saying this guy came in. It was really odd. He had these two girls and he wants to do this presentation. And the officer took his name and ran it through the system. When she did, she realized that he was on parole for kidnapping and rape. So later that day, he shows up again back on campus with the two little girls. He speaks to the police officer and shares that he has written a book that is going to change the world. And that is kind of his thing is he keeps telling everybody when I'm found out, I'm going to change the world. Like this is going to be life changing. After this, she makes a call to his parole officer to make sure that this incident was recorded. And she was telling him that he came in with two daughters and Phillips parole officer said, um, he doesn't have any daughters. The parole officer obviously is concerned and he calls Philip in for a meeting. When he does, he shows up to the meeting with J.C. Dugard. Is he getting bold at this point? I think so because, Maybe because at people this are point seeing it's him. been 18 years. Yeah, and people are seeing He's out in public. There. He's, He's she's toting Alyssa. these kids. Yeah. yeah. By now she's introducing herself and, and that's how she introduced herself to the parole officer was as Alyssa. And when questioned about the two girls, he tells them that they belong to his brother again, but he doesn't know how to contact his brother. So he has his kids, but yet he doesn't know where his brother's at. When they question JC, her story changed multiple times, but never matched Philip's story. So they had them in separate rooms. They were questioning them separately. So after hours of questioning, Philip cracked and told the officers that many years ago he kidnapped JC and that she was the mother of the two girls. When the officers questioned J.C., she confirmed that she was kidnapped by the Garritos almost 20 years prior. The next day, the authorities contacted J.C.'s biological mother to tell her that she had been located. And the following week, on August 26, 2009, she was reunited with her family. And Philip and Nancy Garrido were arrested. They were charged with 29 counts and pleaded not guilty. On July 1st, 2010, the California Assembly passed a bill giving J.C. $20 million to settle her claims against the state's Department of Corrections, which there's no amount of money that is going to ever give her back those 18 years. Uh I always say you can make up for a lot of things, but you can never make up for time. Never. You can never give back somebody time. No. And And she can never be a kid again. She mm -mm. can never live teenage years. And that's her mom's, you know, that's her mom's big thing is like she'll never get to go to prom. Yeah. She'll never get to do all those things that all these kids did through elementary school, middle school, and high school, and even college. She's 29 years old now with two kids. That's, and so I did read that the mother of Philip Gerardo, Garrido, I can't mm-hmm. say his name. I don't want to say his name, <laughs> um, had dementia. Yes. So after... They were arrested. What happened to the mom? Like, is she probably put away? I'm sure. Yeah, probably in a home. Because I know she wasn't living with the father. The father said his son always had problems, Mm -hmm. always had issues with sex. The guy had problems. And so the fact that he was just let out after 11 years, I didn't even know that that was a possibility. I that, I didn't even think so either. That's why I was saying, like, Like, you would think there would be a minimum. Like, how does that even happen? So on June 2nd, 2011, Philip Garrido pled guilty and was sentenced to 431 years to life in a protect. And he's now serving it in a protective housing unit at Corcoran State Prison. Are they letting him out in five years from now? Like, I I don't like, yeah, it's 431 really enough. Yeah. So it's like he's not eligible for parole to like. 2441 or some some crazy ass year. They're like, we're not going to take any chances for him to step in front of a idiot parole board who thought it was a good idea to release a man after 11 years. Not happening. Yeah. And then Nancy is sentenced to 36 years to life and she's right here in Chino. To me, that's not even enough for her. She should, the same amount of time. Yeah, I don't, it's just not even enough time. The mom and the stepdad, are they still married? I don't believe so. No. That would have been a hard, yeah pill to swallow yeah the mom she stayed positive the whole entire time and maybe that's obviously where jc gets her strength from because the mom 
literally just kept pushing on and pushing on and pushing on and just was like, we're going to find her. Never gave up. So they never held a funeral for her? Never. I never declared her? No, she was not ever declared dead. dead. Mm -mm. After years, they would always do the age progression drawings the forensic artists would always try to see what she would look like as an adult they would always hang posters all over the surrounding areas all these years later they would still continue to do that so her books are her first book which is the book that I read is called a stolen life and then her second book is called freedom a book of firsts so I'm assuming that that's probably like her going out for the first time for the first time doing things did she ever get to do a prom or go to a dance? Or yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm, that would I'm be probably an interesting gonna, book to read. Yeah, I'm probably going to read that. How are her kids now? She's very private about them, like I said, but she says that they're doing good. They're in school. Do they have contact with their dad? No. I, no, you no, know, no. You never know. Like, yeah, no. Does he um, write them? Does he, you no, know? No, I don't think there's any contact whatsoever. They would ask her, like, how did you get through all of this being an 11 year old child she just said you know I would miss my mom so much and I guess her and her mom had a thing that every night they would sit on the porch and they would look at the moon and so she said that that's kind of one thing that kept her going was she was looking at the moon every night and she would just wonder if her mom was still doing that and she had a butterfly ring that she kept and hid because I believe he took everything from her he took her clothes from her she was like stripped of all her clothes in the very beginning and she was just there handcuffed but she was able to hide this butterfly ring when she was little and she kept it the whole 18 years that she was there but now today she wears a necklace of a pine cone because she said that that was the last thing that she remembered touching before they kidnapped her. So when they grabbed her, I think she stepped on a pine cone or tripped on a pine cone. And she said that that was the last thing in her mind that she remembered from home, like touching, physically yeah. touching. And so she always has a pine cone around her neck. So I thought that was pretty cool. She started the JC Foundation to help families who survive major life traumas. And I found it interesting that they donated to the Turpin children, which is just oh, the wow. story that we did yeah. last week. So she has a nonprofit organization and does a lot of speaking and she's very, very well spoken. She's very well spoken. She's very soft spoken. Was she ever able to go back to school? I'm wondering. Yeah, I don't know. I know that she basically trying to live her life as normal as possible. She said when she got back, her sister taught her how to drive. But I mean, can you imagine 11 years old just being trapped for 18 years in somebody's backyard? No. And then just being thrown back out into society. At least she had her family. She had her sister and her mom and her her two daughters. Yeah. Yeah. It's a terrible, terrible story. But I'm glad out of because it could have been way worse. So, I mean, we've taught we've covered stories that the outcomes not exactly the success for no for both sides. So Mm -hmm. reading her book, it just always stuck in the back of my head. Just what a positive outlook she had on everything even as a child yeah and then when you see interviews and stuff with her mom you can see like where she gets it from yeah so well thank you for watching another week if you'd like to follow us on uh social media we're at 50 states of madness instagram tiktok our merch store is 50 states of madness.bigcartel.com keep leaving those comments we yeah. love it yeah so thank please. you again to all of our new followers, our new subscribers. Thank you for all of your wonderful comments. Yeah, there's like so many people are like, oh my God, we can't, I can't wait. I love just going home and like listening to you guys. And I, I mean, I, I don't know how entertaining we are, but you know. <laughs> we think we're pretty cool. We think we're pretty entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> so, Well, thank you so much. Yeah, so thank you for joining us for another week and we will see you guys very soon. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Bye.